Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi wa sallamu alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa sallam alayhi wa sallam alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa al'udwani illa ala al-zalimeen wa al-aqibatu lil-muttaqeen Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ala abdika wa rasulika muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. MashaAllah, the energy is so high in here. <laughs> I could feel the roof coming off of this place, alhamdulillah. May Allah bless you all. May Allah accept it from all of you, and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from the volunteers here at ICNA and those that organize this convention. I want you on your way out to thank every single person that you see that's wearing a vest, everyone that's directing traffic, everyone that is operating any element of this. Please say to them, Jazakallahu khaira, on the way out, inshaAllah. So I'm going to ask you all a question. And I'll come back to it, inshallah ta'ala, because I wanted to frame the conclusion of what has been a powerful session as I was listening backstage with something very interesting. How many of you have heard of Abu Bakr as Siddiq radiallahu anhu? Can you raise your hands? All right, good. I just want to make sure. How many of you have heard of a cousin of Abu Bakr by the name of Abdullah ibn Jud'an? Very few of you. So again, how many of you have heard of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu? Good. His name was Abdullah bin Uthman. That's his actual name radiallahu anhu. And he had a cousin named Abdullah bin Jud'an that you may have never heard of. How many of you have heard of Umar bin Khattab? Radiallahu anhu. How many of you have heard of Amr ibn Hisham? Who is he? Abu Jahl. Abu Jahl, more commonly known as Abu Jahl. Now I want to put you in this interesting situation and I'll bring it back to the theme inshallah ta'ala in a moment. I want you to imagine if you walked into Mecca for Hajj in the year 609. When did the Prophet some receive revelation? What year? I know y'all are like, why is he asking us all these questions? 610. The Hajj of the days of ignorance was not like the Hajj now. The Hajj now, which is its original form, a celebration of the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a commitment to full submission to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala in the way of our father Ibrahim alayhi salam was almost exactly the opposite of what it was meant to be. The Hajj which was supposed to be about Allah became about everything but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Hajj which is supposed to erase distinctions became all about distinctions. The Hajj which is supposed to be an exercise of modesty became one of the lewdest practices of all. The irony is they still called it Hajj. They even had a picture of Ibrahim salam in the Kaaba. They had a picture of Maryam salam. They still called it Hajj, but it literally served the opposite function. So you walk there 609. And I want to kind of paint a picture of what you would see beyond the obvious greatest transgression of idol worship. You would see people that are being exploited in real time even by those who were supposed to be in a state of worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You would see complete nudity because they would do hajj without clothes at that time. You would see disgusting claims and sloganeering of tribalism. And interestingly enough, you'd also see great charity. You'd see sadaqah. And the people that would be calling to their homes and boasting about their charity are some of the same people that we scorn today. Abu Jahl, Amr ibn Hisham, would have been known to you as one of the most generous people in Mecca that day. Inviting people to the corner of Banu Makhzum of his tribe, where we feed the people, we take care of the pilgrims, and we relish in the praise of that. 
But when the Prophet ﷺ stood up and called to La ilaha illallah, the real nature of that man came out. And so if you walked into Mecca in 613, the same man that might have been making a public display of taking care of a Sumayya or a Bilal was now torturing them in public. The same man that might have stood up and given a lengthy speech about the importance of unity, about the importance of keeping our tribes together, and we are one hand as Quraysh, was insulting the Prophet ﷺ and putting down the sub-tribes and would come to be the Fir'aun of this Ummah, the Pharaoh of this Ummah. In a matter of a few years, his reality came out. The other man that I mentioned was Abdullah bin Jud'an, who was also a very generous man. The cousin of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And Abdullah ibn Uthman, who was Abu Bakr, was very generous as well. But Abdullah ibn Jud'an is a story of a man who went from poverty to prosperity very quick. He was a very poor man who found a bunch of treasures in the mountains and became one of the wealthiest men in Arabia. And he used to feed the people. And he used to host in his lofty mansion at the time, relatively speaking. But he died without saying, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. And Aisha radiallahu anha asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Ya Rasulullah, Abdullah ibn Jud'an, kana yut'imu ta'am wa yuqri'u dayf. The word should sound familiar to you in Arabic because it's how Khadija radiallahu anha described the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He used to feed the people and he used to take care of the guests. Will any of that benefit him on the Day of Judgment? And the Prophet ﷺ said, no. Because not a day went by where the man said, Rabbi khfirli khati'ati yawm ad-deen. My Lord, forgive me for my sins on the final day. He never once repented. He never made tawbah to Allah. He never came back to his Lord. Now there's a reason why I start off with this framing. You know, some time ago, I gave a khutbah on the vocabulary of a narcissist, qualities of narcissism. Ibn, Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah calls it ana li indi, that these are the words that are ascribed to the tyrants in the Qur'an, me, myself, and I. That if you find that in your vocabulary frequently, then that's a sign of a deeper spiritual disease. And if you think about the psychology of a tyrant, and you ask yourself when you see a tyrant, how do they kill all those children? How do they inflict all sorts of cruelty upon their people and still go to sleep at night? Why would you even do that to people? And of course, we live in a day and age, unfortunately, where tyrants are sanitized by others when it becomes too politically costly to maintain the tyrants and the status of a tyrant. And so to our Syrian brothers and sisters that are here, we know what the criminal Bashar al-Assad did to your people. And even if he is welcomed back into an arena of world leaders, وَمَا كَانَ رَبُّكَ نَسِيَ Your Lord does not forget. And we still have the conscience to still look at a tyrant and say, that's a tyrant. That's a person that killed their people. That's a person that killed other people. While other people buckle and shackle when they see the criminal behavior of the apartheid state of Israel to Palestine and all these so-called progressives and people that are for human rights suddenly can't say a word for our brothers and sisters in Palestine but could sing all day about every, everyone else. We know what oppression looks like. We know what tyranny looks like. You know, when they talk about Palestine and they say that they used to say a land without a people for a people without a land, that's because they didn't even regard the people that were in that land as real people. But we were there. And our Palestinian ancestors were there. And the people of Palestine will continue to be there, bi ta'ala, until the last day. But I want you to think about the psychology of when you think about people 
as non-existent. Does the tyrant hate the people that they kill? Does the narcissist hate the people that they mistreat? Or are they indifferent to those people? They're indifferent because they see one thing and worship one thing and they are sincere to one pursuit and one pursuit alone, and that's power. And anything that gets in the way of my power is a discardable piece of trash. And anyone or anything that can help me reach my power, what I seek of power, is something that I'll consider to be useful and beneficial. But there's no sincerity to anything except for the pursuit of power. Now I want to bring it back to Abu Jahl. I want to bring it back to Abdullah ibn Jud'an, even though there's a difference between the two of them, by the way, because Laysu Sawat, not all of them are the same. Why was Abu Jahl so generous to the people? Why was he so kind? Why was he so charitable so that in 609, if you walked into Mecca, you said, wow, this man embodies the values of altruism and charity and empathy and generosity and hospitality and, and all of these great things. Why was Abu Jahl like that? Because Abu Jahl was about Abu Jahl. That entire time was not about feeding the people. That entire time it was about Abu Jahl being recognized as the one who fed the people. It wasn't about the way he loved to make the travelers smile and give food to the hungry. It was about his ego needing to be stroked in his position in society to be told that Amr ibn Hisham, Abu al-Hakam, the father of wisdom, and see subhanAllah, how Allah flipped it on him. The Prophet ﷺ said, Man samma'a samma Allahu bihi, wa man yura'a yura'a Allahu bih. Whoever tries to make people hear of their good, Allah will make people hear of their evil. Whoever tries to show off their good, Allah will show off their evil. Look how insincere he was and look what Allah ﷺ did to him. He worked that whole time to build up a name of the father of wisdom and he goes down in history as the father of ignorance. But it was never about feeding the people. It was never about caring about the people. It was about him the entire time. His goal was to inflate his own sense of importance, meaning Abu Jahl had no loyalty to any cause, had no actual value system, had no actual moral anchor. All he cared about was himself. And sometimes people can give off slogans. They can say what you want to hear. But at the end of the day, they're not about you. They're not trying to help you. They don't care about you. And for an innocent person, it's hard at times to be able to understand someone who's so insincere. The Prophet ﷺ was known as a Sadiq Al Amin. He was truthful, trustworthy, honorable. We know he's for us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We know he cares about us. We know that even if we persecute him in Mecca, even when they persecute him, there is no person more trustworthy because the man وسلم, is loyal to his principles. He's not like Abu Jahl. He's anchored in something else. He's trustworthy. He's truthful. And you know, those same terms, subhanAllah, that same noble trait, guess who else called themselves Amin? Anyone know? The devil himself, the devil himself, when he came to Adam السلام, and he told Adam السلام, look, I'm telling you to eat from this tree. And he said, Inni lakum nasihun ameen. I'm an honest, sincere, trustworthy advisor to you. I care about you. I'm only telling you about this tree because it's good for you. And when Allah Azzawajal asked Adam السلام, how he fell for it, how he disobeyed. He said, Ma dhanantu anna ahadan yuqsimu billahi kadiba. He said, I didn't think that people could swear by the name of Allah and lie. Adam السلام, could not believe that Iblis would say to him, Wallahi, I'm for you, I'm doing this for you. This is all about you. Ma dhanantu anna ahadan yuqsimu billahi kadiba. I didn't think it was possible for someone to use the name of Allah in vain because Adam السلام, was sincere. Now, why do I bring this all up and what does this have to do with the topic of faith, family, values? There's a beautiful hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, and it's one of the most comprehensive ahadith 
of our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam قال الدين النصيحة وفي رواية إن الدين النصيحة إن الدين النصيحة إن الدين النصيحة The religion is sincerity. You want to know what the greatest value system of Islam is? That's supposed to transpire in every interaction that you have with your Lord, with your family, with your community, with your society. It's nasiha, it's sincerity. With your brother or sister who you love, or your brother or your sister who's a little rough with you, it's nasiha, it's a sense of sincerity, a sense of sincere advice. ad nasiha. And we said to who, O Messenger of Allah? Liman ya Rasulullah? He said to Allah, Lillah, wali kitabihi, and to his book. Wali Rasulihi and to his messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he mentioned Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Waliya Immatil Muslimin wa Amatihim, and to the leaders of the Muslims and to every single one of them. It's sincerity that you wish well towards them, that you're for them, you're not for yourself. And sincerity looks different to every one of those parties. Sincerity to Allah is not like sincerity to the people. It's a different type of sincerity because it's one that entails obedience as well. But in that contract of sincerity, what that means to everybody around you is that you actually care about their well-being. Your greatest value proposition as a Muslim to every single person in your life is that you actually want them to succeed. And the Prophet ﷺ could look at anybody in the eyes, his daughter Fatima radiallahu ta'ala anha, when she asked him of something worldly. And when he's talking to his uncles or his aunts, or he's talking to the furthest person of society, and then he calls out to the most precious and beautiful person in the world to him, Fatima al Zahra radiallahu anha, and says to her, Go ahead and ask me for my money, whatever you want. But I can't protect you on the Day of Judgment. You have to do this yourself. When the Prophet ﷺ called you to Islam, it was clearly because he cared about you. It was clearly because he loved you. What does sincerity look like to our families? Parents in particular. When you want your kid to be religious, is it so that you can put him up as a trophy and say that, look, I've got a kid that, mashallah, does this and does this and does that? And let me tell you something. When your kid falls, do you say to them, you're embarrassing us. I don't want people to say this and this and this and that. They need to know from you that you want them to be saved for them. That you want them to have a place in Al-Jannah. That you care about them. And when you're able to sh reshape your conversation with your own children, it changes the dynamic. This is for you. And even if they can't hear you at that moment. And by the way, I say that to the children as well, that don't see your parents as your opponents or your enemies. Your parents love you more than they love themselves. Parents, your kids have to hear that from you. That I want you to succeed. I don't care if everybody else in the world thinks you're a success or thinks you're a failure. I care about you meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a success and not as a failure. That's to your family. What's nasiha look like to your community? To those that are around you? That when you walk into the masjid, those brothers and sisters that are around you, I want you to be saved. I want you to go to Jannah. What does sincerity look like to your society? That you're not trying to score cheap political points with everybody around you. You're not trying to, to win a Twitter battle in real life. You actually care about the well-being of people. You want them to be saved in this life and in the next. And people have to know that when we show up as Muslims, that we show up for them, that we care about them. And that starts with how we deal with each other, dear brothers and sisters. If when you see your brother or your sister fall, and your first instinct is to laugh at them or to mock them, if you see them utter statements that could compromise their safety in the hereafter, or you see them start to fall away from Islam, and your first instinct is to chuckle about it and sneer about it and to make fun of it and to pass on that news, examine your heart because Allah might forgive them for their slip but not forgive you for your pride. You have to go back and interrogate yourself and say, am I nasih to that person or was it about me the entire time? What about that person? Am I sincere to my brother or sister? You know, when we talk about the different 
diseases, social, moral diseases, a society that can't define any set of coherent principles, that can't define anything about what a human being is supposed to be. What's our value proposition when we come to the table? That we have a sincerity that leads us to a level of consistency in how we deal with the issues of society around us because ad din al nasiha Sincerity is there. That we want to save people. That we want to help people. And so what that translates into is a consistent moral program. Our morality is unlike the claims to morality that other people have because it's anchored in a sincere belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He defines morality and that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala entrusts us to go out and to live that morality, to call people to it and to live it in the most beautiful of ways in our own lives so that people see the difference between what we claim and what we attach ourselves to and what other people attach themselves to. And so you talk about the pornography, disease of pornography in the world today. As Muslims, we can step to the table and we can say we care about the person in front of the screen and we care about the person behind the scene. And I'm sincere to wanting to help my brother that's addicted to it and sincere in wanting to help those that are trafficked by it. I'm sincere to people in regards to their dunya and in regards to their akhirah. That's what we bring in terms of nasiha to everything and everyone around us. That's what the Prophet ﷺ was able to anchor himself in. That's why the Prophet ﷺ did not have the moral blind spots. And we as Muslims should not have the moral blind spots of the political right or the political left. That's why the Prophet ﷺ gave us something that is universal and that can apply to all times. That's what allows us to maintain the moral high ground. That our sense of salvation and wanting to bring the people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one that seeks to save them in this life and in the next. And I'm going to end with this, by the way. We have to change the way that we see each other. Let me tell you something. Imam Siraj Wahad said something years ago, and I've quoted him so many times, he, I, I've forgotten how many times I've quoted him on it. When Imam Siraj sees other Muslims behaving like buffoons to each other, treating other brothers and sisters like enemies that they want to drag down into hellfire. As if you want to pull people into Jahannam the way Shaitan wants to pull people into Jahannam. And Imam Siraj said something that was so profound. He said, we're all on the same team. You don't go and abuse your teammate. You don't take your own out. Your sincerity to each other as individuals, as organizations, as efforts, you're on the same team. Ad-Din al-Nasiha. Try to help your brother or your sister. When you see your brother or your sister falling, don't laugh, cry. Don't, don't speak about them, speak to Allah about them. Make dua for them. Don't tell others about how messed up they are. Call them and tell them, I want to help you get out of this place that you're in. That's what's going to make you different on the Day of Judgment. That's what differentiates a Sadiq Al-Ameen from the one who claimed to be Nasih Al-Ameen. Is an actual desire to save people. We ask Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala to save us and to rectify us and to purify our hearts and we ask Allah to guide and to rectify and to purify through us all of those that are around us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put in our hearts the love of Allah and the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the love of all that is beloved to Allah and the hatred of all that is hated to Allah. Allahumma habib ilayna al-iman wa zayyinhu fi qulubina wa karrih ilayna al-kufra wal fusuqa wal-isyan. وجعلنا من الراشدين اللهم امين جزاكم الله خير والسلام عليكم ورحمه الله وبركاته